Yo, what up, fam? It's Maris with Critical Root Zone, where we dig deep with inquiring minds to get to the root of sustainability. Want to know why I started this podcast? My belief that a positive, sustainable climate is critical to me and you and all that we love and enjoy about our planet. I want to learn more about the problems we face on a daily basis and why they seem like we have no control over them, because I believe we do. My guests will range from all walks of life. And I want to hear from you. What do you think? What do you believe? Let's make a lasting and permanent change together. Please subscribe and join me as we get to the root of the problems here on CRZ. Welcome back to CRZ. I'm your host, Maris, the Maris Vibes, DJ Earthbird, and we are in our third episode of Earth Angels. And so if you saw the first two, seen the first two, uh, Bobby Smith and Haynes Motzinger were my first two guests. Go back and watch or listen to their episodes because they all lead in to this final episode of the series, which my dear friend, Grace Stranch, is here today. I couldn't wait to get her on this show. We have been trying so hard. She is a busy woman to nail down, let me tell you. She is so involved in Nashville, in our community, doing exceptional work. Um, she's she's so passionate about what she does. She is always teaching us, always guiding us, and um, it's beautiful. And I'm so happy to have you here today, Grace. And thanks for having me. Yay, yay, yay. I was so pumped. Um, <laughs> Grace also lives around the corner from me, and we just finally, we've lived around the corner for each other for a while, and I just went over to your house for like the first time. That's how busy we are. That's it's how true. stinking busy we are. But um, you are the CEO of the Harpeth Conservancy. Congratulations. Thank you. Because that was, when did when did you get? April. April of last year. Mm -hmm. So it's a full year. Yeah. This is your anniversary. This is my anniversary. Oh, my gosh. Harpeth Conservancy is super cool. I, we work a lot together on different um, things. I work for Tennessee Environmental Council, uh, another nonprofit. And we are we are at the forefront of the political lines these days, doing all sorts of work. Um, let's talk about Harpeth and, yeah. and what, what you do there. So Harpeth Conservancy's vision is clean water and healthy ecosystems for rivers in Tennessee, championed by those who live here, mm. like you and all your listeners yeah. and viewers. <laughs> And so we do that through um, a triangulation of responsible policy, strong community engagement, and sound science. And we're a science-based nonprofit. So the science undergirds all of our work, and it impacts. We use the data to influence policy by engaging community members, and we do a blend of grassroots and grass tops to really make systemic change in Tennessee. Grassroots and grass talks? Tops. Tops. What is that? So we're working, the grassroots are working with communities on all different levels. We're amplifying voices of those who are have been strategically oppressed or marginalized or maybe don't usually have their, you know, they're not at the table generally. Mm -hmm. But then we're also working with influencers. We're working, and I, and I don't say influencers as say you, for instance, <laughs> but you are an influencer. Yeah, you're working with one right now. But I, but I, I mean more, you know, government officials, legislators, heads of businesses. Decision makers. Decision makers, exactly. So, I mean, it's a, it's a blend. Some groups just do grassroots work, which is so important and needed. Some just do grass tops work, and they don't really have their foot or understanding of what's happening in communities on the ground. Mm. But for us to have that systemic change, you really have to be working at all different angles. And so that's what we do oh. at Harpeth Conservancy. And so that's how we're able to really have that systemic change is because we're tackling the problems from a variety of different angles yes. of what's in, of how our rivers are impacted. And I do want to note, um, I always have to say this, you know, mm -hmm. my facts, if you know me, if you've seen me speak, you will always hear these over and over and over again until all of you know, and you can tell all of your friends. <laughs> Our Tennessee rivers are part of the third most aquatically biodiverse hotspots in the world. Mm. In Tennessee, the Duck River is the most aquatically biodiverse river in all of North America. It's third in the world. So we are just incredible for our biodiversity, but it's not just our biodiversity. Around 60% of our drinking water comes from our rivers yep. and around 60% of our rivers do not meet federal drinking or federal water quality standards. Wow. So we have a lot 
of work to do. And then the last fact, we have a major global impact. Around 10% of the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico can be attributable to what happens in Tennessee. Mm. So our rivers are not only lifelines for our incredible species, but for humans and communities. And when it's not done well, we have humans who die from poor zoning and flood zones. We have we pay more money for our water to clean it up when we don't take care of it on the front end. And so we're working on for our communities and our wildlife and the intersection because it's all a part of Tennessee. Wow. You said so many things I want to touch on in there. That was so amazing. First of all, hell yeah, Tennessee is <laughs> dope. I mean, Tennessee, wow. I didn't think I'd be here for as long as I have. I've been here over 10 years now. Never thought. From Jersey to Florida, to the, from the East Coast, living by the ocean, I moved to Tennessee thinking, I can't stay here. There's no ocean. I can't stay here. We right? have beautiful rivers. We have rivers and lakes and just this abs- absurd, beautiful landscape to discover and explore and in order to to keep that alive and well and thriving we have to do the work y'all newsflash you've got to be a part of this conversation and that's why I've got Grace on the show today is she has been man your family has really instilled (laughs) a lot of this in you and um, you went to law school with uh, an ad on the advocacy track is Mm -hmm. what you told me which Man, our hearts are just so aligned. I wish I could have been in school with you. God, we have been like You'd have besties. Loved it. <laughs> but we're here today. That's all that matters. And and your family is they have a long lineage, line of of, of history in this work. So is that how you yeah, got here so kind of? I grew up on a farm in Bellevue, so mm. I kinda had the best of both worlds. I was near the city. I went to all public schools in Nashville. You know, I'm really a part of this community. My family's from you know, rural Middle Tennessee um, and rural East Tennessee. And so I've been really connected to the community. And my grandfather started a lot like TEC mm-hmm. and was on the board of starting T- uh, Tennessee Conservation Voters. Yeah. And so I always knew how important the values were of the land and the environment. But beyond that, he also did a ton of civil rights work and, you know, represented the Highlander Folk School where, you know, has quotes from him for Martin Luther King and represented, started kind of the union practice in Tennessee, was one of the main writers of the Metro Charter. Hmm. And so for me, I learned from a very young age that you have to care for your community and that community involves people, but it also involves the environment. And so it's the intersection of all of that. That's all a part of my community. Hmm. And so I'm so strongly community-based of, I want a future in Tennessee for everyone. This is my home. And you can't have that if you don't have clean water, if you don't have clean air, and if you don't have a strong sense of community and you're finding this individualism that's pushing out, everyone has to be individual and do things themselves. And instead of realizing the values of us working together from all sides. And I will say with Harpeth, one of the things I really love about Harpeth Conservancy is that we truly work with Democrats and Republicans. If you look at our board, our, you know, our board chair is Republican, half of our board, over half of our, con- uh, half of our advisory council And it just shows you when you look at messaging, water pulls the best of almost any issue that can bring people together on different sides of the political spectrum because people realize the value in clean water. We have to have clean water to live. And so we have to be making the decisions, whether it's where to place a development, how to place a development, what does a floodplain look like? How can we keep our water quality safe? How can we grow in a responsible way? I mean, we're the sixth fastest growing state in the US. Wow, yeah. So people want to come here like you and I'm Uh like, great, but I'm like, but let's grow responsibly so that the reason so many people want to come here for the most visited national park in the U.S., for the most caves of anywhere in the U.S., Mm -hmm. for our beautiful river systems, that we are protecting what makes our state so incredible. Gosh, and I I just want to say thank you for, I mean, stepping into those shoes, right? Because you have the opportunity not everybody has that opportunity. For sure. You were you were brought up in a world that gave you a lot of insight right off the bat. And I can attribute that to my mom too. I've I've been raised by a woman who who taught me how to care, who taught me to look outside myself, who who taught who taught me to look at the environment and say, We are the same. Without you, I don't exist. Without me, you exist, right? Mm-hmm. It doesn't need us, but we need it. And and that symbiotic relationship and just what everything that you spoke on and, and how people, not everybody has a seat at the table, right? And representing those people and thinking about where they're at. And that's how you and I met. Yeah. <laughs> we were both at a, a Maddox fund. Um, like they were like revisualizing their mission, which was going to be inclu- including more BIPOC 
ideas and, and thinking in that lens, which we're now doing at TEC. And I'm so, I'm so happy to be here in Tennessee and to be a part of the solution, right? Yeah. We, our tagline at TEC is be the solution. <laughs> and here I am, this, this foreigner, right? I, I came from the East Coast, but now I consider myself a Tennessean. But I, we'll I mm-hmm. see that. I, I, went, I felt more love and light in my life when I felt a part of something. So what you touched on, community, working together. We don't have to be these people fighting one, one by ourselves, right? One man bands. This is go out, go out and get weird. Go, go get uncomfortable, <laughs> get you know? Weird. Get weird. Uh, get in the soil. Go, go on a hike. Go, go challenge yourself with something new that makes you feel like kind of scared. <laughs> go do that, right? Um, but what you said about, what you said about your family and, and how all of those things matter at a young age too, like how kids matter and how making that a part of their lives. Like that's not every, that's not in everybody's life for sure. From the beginning. So right now we have some political things going on. You and I worked hand in hand and we're, I'm a communications manager at TEC. So it's really important the messaging. And I, I come to you for a lot of that, the wetlands bill, the science mm-hmm. and the policy that work hand in hand. I think that's really unique and really beautiful because we need that data and that's what you use Man, that makes me think of so many things <laughs> <laughs> in the world today where it's like science, right? Like, let's think yeah, about that, science, right? Like, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a lot of truth. There's a lot of truth in there. So let's talk about that. So the Harpeth Conservancy has been um, kind of going fighting this bill because federally there was a bill that went through EPA or gave EPA less um, control, right? It was a, it was a actually a determination from a Supreme Court decision, EPA versus Sackett. And so it was the interpretation of how mm. the clean waters were um, understood. And so before a wetland was considered, there was numerous tests that were allowed to determine whether or not um, a wetland was jurisdictional, which means it had protections, yeah. these federal protections. And before, as long as you could find a nexus, so, oh, there's like biological, there's habitat, it's connected, maybe it's not, you know, visibly connected, it would still have that protection. And what the Supreme Court decision did in May was it took away the nexus test. And so basically now, simplest terms is if you cannot see the water on over land directly connected to a wetland, it is now considered isolated and no longer has that federal protection. So what that meant, was all across the U.S., states that didn't have better protection immediately lost protections of these wetlands. And if you look, you know, historically, Tennessee has already lost around 60% of our wetlands. And you'll see those numbers similar kind of across the U.S. Yeah. But we are unfortunate that when you think about how unique our waterways are, that we have better protections to protect our natural resources. And I say our natural heritage in mm-hmm. Tennessee. And so we are um, Tennessee water... Uh, Quality Control Act protects the groundwater. And so a lot of people don't have that protection. So we have the protection of if those wetlands are connected underground, they're still considered protected under Tennessee law. Right. And so what happened was, is we had a bill that was brought in the legislature actually last session, and then it was brought back for this, for this um, term. And that bill would have gotten rid of protections for 55% of our wetlands, remaining wetlands in Tennessee. Yikes. Yeah, it's terrifying. And I, it's so interesting because I actually got some responses when we did some action alerts uh, through our channels of, you know, this is my land, you know, this is my decision. Basically, like, mm-hmm. people that see it through a different lens, like, they own that property, so they want that they want that control. They still have the control. This, right? this the, What this actual law does is what it would take away is the mitigation. So you can still sell your land and do what you want with your land. The difference is, is that you have to follow certain procedures because all of our water is a system. It's not separate. Your water on your land impacts your neighbor's land and impacts downstream. And I will say, you know, well, they say, well, they can just sue under nuisance or other trespassing. Well, yeah, if you're really, really wealthy and have time and can afford an attorney, but in essence, you're not going to... Go you're not going to win those lawsuits. I mean, sometimes you will, but you'll have to spend a lot of money to do it. So it's also an equity issue. And so when you take from the system, you have to you you want to make sure that you're ensuring that our whole system as a whole isn't impacted. Mm-hmm. So it's really just saying, you know, okay, you can sell this land, but if it's in a floodplain, you have to do all of these extra things to make sure that it's safe so that you're not flooding whole communities downstream. So though you're not taking away the groundwater that is extremely important, whether it's filling our aquifer, which is all of, most of West Tennessee's drinking water, 
or whether if you look at tons of rivers also use it for recharge. And it's extremely important, these wetlands, for during off seasons or during times of drought, a lot of times some some of our flows are completely from these ephemeral streams or from these wetlands. So we have to say to ourselves is, yes, if you want to sell your land, you have a right to do that, but you don't have an in, a right to impact everyone's community and not take that into account. And especially when you're going to have massive flooding. And let's also talk about like your utilities and bills for clean water. Wetlands naturally filter out heavy metals, lead, contaminants, PFAS, PFOAs, other emerging contaminants, which there will be eventually regulations on. And when those are no longer in existence to filter that out, what happens are is that utilities then have to take up that mantle and they have to improve their systems or they have to do more so that they can get the water at the same level, the same quality. And who pays for that? We do. Rate payers. Yep. So for me, it's not about, I'm not saying you can't do what you want with your land, but I'm saying- these systems have been in place for a long time, and it's so that everyone can have land, you know, and, and it doesn't even, this bill also doesn't even preclude farmers. Farmers can still do what they want on their land. Right. This only pertains to if they sell their land. And my argument is always like, are we farming houses <laughs> or are we, right. you know, what are we farming? What right. do we care about? Which is is the it when you sell factor, the farm yeah. Yeah. or is it what you're actually doing? Because if you're actually farming the land, you're already exempt from this law. So it's, it's really interesting. Interesting, and, and what I would say is who this really benefits are the people who initially develop because the market's going to have the same prices for houses, but they're just not going to have to pay mitigation costs now. Mm. And what that really does mm. is the I think it's around 430,000 acres that could potentially be at risk. Well, let's double that or triple that because now you're not having mitigation. Mm. So those areas where you're doing restoration projects, where you're fixing things and, and doing these projects to help in other, other parts of the full system – to account for that, that's not happening now. And those areas might now also be be developed. So it has a huge cascading effect right. that wouldn't have happened, you know, without allowing this. Those systems in place doesn't mean you can't do it, but we need to be actually looking Checks at Checks and this. balances, man. We have to be reviewing yeah. versus what they want is, you know, no checks and balances on these what they call low quality wetlands, but it doesn't mean no quality. Yeah. They do a ton for our ecosystem. So- <laughs> You know, if they get rid of 800 acres, you're going to have, you know, you listen to Tima's testimony, you know, you're going to have flooding. Mm -hmm. You're going to have worse water quality. You're going to have less of the things that we consider of a value to the communities in Tennessee. Mm -hmm. And if if, if nothing else, you should care about your drinking water. If nothing else, if you don't care about the land, seeing a beautiful river, it is still what sustains us. Thank you for clarifying that. That was <laughs> that was amazing. Yeah, because I remember getting that email back and being like, "What does this even mean? What is this guy talking about?" You know, um, because everybody everybody has a voice. Everybody's valid. And I think what I was trying to go to before when I was getting deep, but I didn't really have my direction. I was <laughs> like, "It's all about the community," and that's what you keep. Like, I love that it keeps coming back up naturally. It's it could, that is my mission. That is a mission of CRZ to love the planet, and in order to love the planet, we have to love each other. You have to think outside yourself. And, and, and honestly, I mean, this is very specific to you, like you said, to your drinking water, to your future, to our future together. And I love what you said about how this isn't just about like, yeah, you got land and you've, you can do what you want with it, but it affects other people. What you do affects other people. Mm-hmm. What you say affects other people. You know, um, we can learn, we can go back, we can say, I'm sorry. We can say, oh, I didn't know that. But we have to be aware and open to hearing a different point of view scientists, lawyers, people that have experience with this, with this stuff mm-hmm. that are literally only doing it for our benefit. <laughs> mm-hmm. This is not the, where's the profit in it for you? You know, like this is, this is for everyone. And so the wetlands bill, which we just, you know, is back and forth. And we, we've been spending a lot of time at the Capitol. We just did our conservation education day, which is so cool. We're going to be doing it next year. So if you're in Nashville or yes. in Tennessee, literally mm-hmm. the whole state where we're, we're going to have this great event next year in 2025, probably in February that just invites people to come to the Capitol and get to know your legislators and get to know the process because this is our democracy democracy. This is how we fight for what we need and what we want and, and learn, right? We can go up there stomping our feet and say, this is what, this is what is mine or, you know, what I deserve. But actually, no, the checks and balances system is there to say, well, what about this guy over here? What about this piece of science or data? Like there's, there's just a lot that goes into this. So next thing that we're going to talk about, Politics. <laughs> I mean, we, we kind of were already, but it's like uh, something that you said that that struck me in our 
conversation the other day was everything is politics. It's, it's relational. This is our country. This is what, this is how it works. He said another thing that I really liked. He said, we must understand the system to change the system. Be involved, right? Know these different groups that are doing work and make community. Go and make friends and learn and band together. Your voices are stronger together. And then we learn how to be more efficient in that way, right? We're all stomping around on our own. <laughs> it's not really like, okay, well, everybody's just whining now. Or just, we just got complainers out there. They don't know what they're doing. They're talking about, but to be taken seriously, there's a process to this. So let's talk about that, you know, and your experience and, and what, how you feel about that process, because I want to instill confidence in that again, you know, as young people, you know, we're, we're doing things that it's not very common for people yeah. our age to be going out and, and there are people doing it, but just saying, I want to inspire people on that process again. So yeah, with, with any words of encouragement or, or sharing your, your experience in that realm would be amazing. Yeah. I think people feel disempowered and feel that there's no hope. And I will just say, you know, I have watched legislators change their mind based upon personal stories from constituents. And will it always happen? No, but you're building a coalition of people who can bring facts and stories and, you know, new ideas. And it's really important. I mean, people, these local elections, which really impact your day-to-day -day life, when you look at how zoning impacts your community, huge, huge impacts that most people don't pay attention to. Some of those elections can come down to a couple hundred votes. I mean, they are very, very minuscule, yeah. the, the differences. And so when people say, you know, well, it doesn't matter if I vote here because the person I want will never get it. Well, are you looking at the judges who are up for, for election? Are you looking at the school boards? Are you looking at, you know, how, like in what, in what way? And so I think, it can be very overwhelming and confusing. And especially people who move here, they're like, Absolutely. the system is not clear for a lot of people. And so I think part of that, and that's why I think the value is, is getting involved with these different organizations who are already kind of doing the work and getting plugged in and realizing that there's networks of different nonprofits and other groups who are working on these different issues. So for Harpeth Conservancy, we work on huge systemic issues that you can get involved with. We work, you know, on legislation. We work on permitting. So you that- talk about zoning. Yeah. Zoning is huge. When you talk about putting, you know, a giant development in an area that doesn't have sewage or enough water, drinking water. I mean, that's a huge example. Or in the middle of a floodplain, which is going to create safety issues. All of those things, you know, they, those happen on the local levels. Those decisions, those zoning changes happen. And so if you have enough you know, community members who can say, hey, we're really concerned about this. You know, this is a horrible place for this development. And I will say, I just want to always note, we are not anti-development. We work with a lot of developers who we really like, but we are really conscious of responsible development and conservation focused and understanding that not every area should be developed. There are not the resources. If you do not have enough water to support those communities, then you shouldn't be building a community in that area. And, you know, we're seeing this, some of our our most of our growth, for instance, is the Duck River, our most aquatically biodiverse river in all of North America. There's all of these water withdrawals. But when you look at how much water is in the river and the capacity that during these low flows areas, we have some of the only mussels and salamanders and all these really unique critters that will die if the water gets too low and they will be gone forever, like forever. Mm -hmm. And so for me, you have to understand like how these local decisions, how these permits. So that's why I say we work on rule changes. We work on permits. We work on legislation. There are so many different ways on different structures, whether it's statewide, local, your city. There are so many different structures that your voice, that you can come, become an expert on. And maybe you just don't have capacity or time. And it's a privilege to have time sure. to be able to review yes. and understand all of these concepts. But that is the beauty of finding groups like us. Follow us on social media. We'll keep you updated. Get on our newsletter. Mm -hmm. You know, ask me if there's a topic that you want to know more. I probably know a nonprofit who's working on it. I probably know the person who I can say, hey, I'm not doing that, but I know a lot of people who are. And part of that is because I'm a part of the community. You know, I show up for the community. I, that's how we meet. You know, that's how you make friends and that's how you develop. And I will say, you know, you won't win every fight, but, you know, we are building a stronger community of people who care and we will start seeing changes over time as we build that coalition and we're already seeing changes. I mean, right now we'll know in the next, you know, 
within the hour, <laughs> whether or not we're going to, if wetlands is going to be resurrected or if, you know, 10 HB 1054 and the Senate bill, I think 1063 are done. And that means that we'll have a time It'll be sent to summer study. And what that means is that we will get together with stakeholders and we'll have experts and the time to actually make sure that we're making a policy decision that makes sense for Tennessee. And we're not rushing something that could impact so many Tennesseans. Yeah. And you said this was already introduced. So this has come back. Yeah, it was it was tabled. So it was brought up last session. So he didn't have to reintroduce it. It was already in existence because we have two ter- two terms. And so this is the end mm. of the session. So any bills for next term will have to be put in anew, basically. Got it. So like at the end of this session. At the end of this session, the session's done. Then we'll start a new session next year. When and it'll be two years. Uh, okay. Mm-hmm. So when it's tabled, it's in the same session. When it's tabled. Yeah, it was. I mean, it, there's different mechanisms. They can withdraw it. They can... There's a lot of different things that could happen to bills that could impact what happens next. But Which this is one, why, like, yeah, like, you, it's you're, complicated. The, you're the professor, you're the expert, and that's why it's like... And I'm not even an expert, you yeah, know, yeah. I'm, you know, I'm not you a are. professional lobbyist, <laughs> but I learned the system and I understand it. Um, but, you know, I learned from, I have so many friends and people who work on the Hill that I ask questions for. Yeah. And, you know, our purpose really is we want to educate the community on issues that impact our rivers. And if we don't know, then we find out together, right? Exactly. We, we keep going together and that gives us purpose. That gives us wholeness. And that connects to the very first part of my mission of feeling love for yourself and feeling whole yourself and, and being able to bring your special skills and ideas to the table. And that's, that's important. All of those things are so important. And what you talked about on the local level, right? Cause I'll, I'm always on this journey in policy my journey is to hear all sides. My journey Smart. is to know what everybody's saying and respect what everybody's saying and to develop my own ideas and thoughts because I don't want to think anymore like I didn't go to school for that so therefore I don't have a seat at the table or therefore I my, what I think isn't important or you know to the conversation. It sure is. Everybody needs to open their mouth when it's right, right? When it's due. Is if I, I was just sitting out here talking and then people start to... It just like starts to fade out. Nobody's listening anymore. Um, but what what I hear a lot of people saying when I ask them about voting or you know what do you believe in with the, with the political system, um, a lot of the response is, yeah, I, I'll do some local politics, but I won't do federal, right? Like I'm not doing anything outside state, or maybe they do state, but they won't. They look they don't like to get involved with the federal aspects of law. That's interesting. I um, hear the opposite. Oh, really? Yeah, that people only care about the presidential election and they okay. don't get involved in any of the local issues or. I've elections. Had, there's those two those two extremes because it really is that too. It's like, oh, the presidency this year, like it is a presidential election year. Ah! And we have <laughs> very low turnout in Tennessee. We are one of the lowest. Like right. it is bad. In Locally Tennessee. too though, right? Oh, everywhere. Yeah. Across the board, Tennessee has very low voter Ooh, turnout. Which, got it. Mm. <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm rolling over my seat here because like, that, I mean, I was one of those people a long time ago who just didn't even think about it. And I was like, I don't want to think about it. It, it. it is too much. It's too much. And, but wait, the way that we govern ourselves and allows me to have the life that I live is too much. I don't even have kids, y'all. I don't even, I don't, I don't even have like a lot of things that people have that it really, really, really affects. Um, but yeah, what are your thoughts on, on that? Like just from local to state to federal and like, yeah, this is a presidential election year. We weren't going to talk about like the actual candidates, but like, what is the importance of who leads our country to I mean, down to the smallest? I think what people don't think about with presidencies a lot of times is that they are responsible for appointing all of the heads of agencies. So when people are like, there's no difference, it doesn't matter, who cares? I'm like, well, I can tell you there is a very big difference of who runs, who's on the National Labor Relations Board, who is running the Environmental Protection Agency. You know, all of those agencies that the people that are put in place, they're going to have a different lens of doing things and they are going to have different rules that protect our water and, and, you know, different candidates might have different perspectives even within the parties. So it's really important to understand and look at the specific candidates' policies and, and who would they appoint for these positions? What are their ideas? But beyond that, I mean, they're appointing the judges. So, you know, we have seen big, massive changes based upon Supreme Court decisions, and people tend to focus on that. But I can tell you there are plenty of cases that don't make it to the Supreme Court that impact your day-to-day life yeah. that are decided on a federal level whether it's in your, you know, in your state, you know, appeals courts that don't make it there that still have a huge impact on you. 
And the president is the one who determines who get these federal judgeships that are for life. Mm -hmm. So if you think that it doesn't have a huge impact on your life or that there's no difference, I would argue, look at the different judges appointed, look at who runs the agencies, look at the policies behind those agencies. And, and I'm all for people pushing candidates for what they care about and working to get their policy positions in place. But I think people often just think about maybe one or two issues and don't think about the system as a whole. Mm -hmm. And so I think that also goes to the individual thinking is that we're not thinking of the community and how, what are all the, how are all of these other agencies impacted by this federal government? Yes. And who's run by them and what rules are in place and what rules are repealed. It's mm, really, mm. really important and impacts you on a far more more important, you yeah. know, these small detailed levels that people don't realize. And so when you're thinking just one issue, you're missing out on a plethora of the judges who will who will be interpreting the laws. Right. So it's not even just that. It's it's the people you're voting for who are making the laws, but it's also who's interpreting the laws because yeah. that can have a huge impact too. And so it's the whole system that you really need to be analyzing and paying attention to yeah. and the impacts from the very lowest level to the highest and really be making an informed decision of how will this impact me? How will 30 or 40 more judges for life in my district or in my circuit impact my life when these decisions come in front of them, when it comes to workers' wages, when it comes to environmental protections, when it comes to zoning issues. I mean, all of these things are, you know, on the state level, you can vote for your state judges. And if you're not getting out there and you're not voting for the judge, you know, they should be impartial. They shouldn't be have a political affiliation. Right, like right. that's not what judges are supposed to be. Yeah. And so but you need to like that would be a good idea to get involved in the legal community and ask them. Like they put out polls, for instance, of um, they poll all of the attorneys that, who about the judicial candidates and on the state level. And you can get that list. You can go online, look at the National Bar Association, and they'll send out an email. Wow. And so you can ask, okay, what are other attorneys who practice with these people? How do they feel about their competency or their mm. level? Or, or do they like them? I mean, these are ways to get informed. And yes, it might be stressful. But again, if you don't know where to start, come to the organizations. <laughs> we'll get you plugged in. They can answer your questions. There a it is. lot of groups do voting guides. So if yeah. you're just like, I am so overwhelmed. If you find an organization that holds your values, you know, they're doing a lot of that right. vetting process. So if you don't have the time to do the full vetting process on your own, it doesn't mean just don't stay on the sideline. Right. Because your life's going to be impacted whether you're on the sideline or not. Right. So the question is, is do you want to have control of your community and your life? Right. And, and sitting out on the sideline? No. It's horrible Doesn't when it comes to, to your day to day. Yeah. Yeah. That's beautiful, Grace. Thank you. Yeah. The the politics aspect of science of the environment, that's what led me really into it head first was knowing that if if I care deeply about something, right? Like we're saying, it's not only affecting me, it's affecting everyone. And that's why that's what the most mind boggling thing has always been for me was, wait, but <laughs> This is all of us. Why are there only a few? And I almost, I used to get upset when people would be like, I'm so happy you're doing that, Maris, or you're so passionate about it. And I know it came from a place of love and admiration, but I was like, yeah, well, I'd love it if you did it too. Mm -hmm. Or <laughs> like, just vote. Like, yeah, there's like bare do, minimums. There, right. There's, you do, know. do what is in your power, right? You said time, time. That's what I, I tried to be really aware of with people it was like, yeah, they might not have the time. I've done that before where I've reached out to a group and said, oh, it's voting time and I don't know what I'm doing. Can you give me some ideas? And somebody that was a lawyer in this particular group came and emailed me directly and was like, here's what I got. Here's what I got. Here's what, here's what you can do. So there are resources out there. Har Harpeth Conservancy is one. I'm, I would really love to work on, on something with you, maybe like a little bit of a resource page or something that I can link to my, to my social media and to my YouTube. And, um, and just tying it all in together, you know, be involved, be civically engaged. Words from Grace over here. Um, have the conversation, right? Be open and uh, think about somebody other than yourself. Like it starts with you and that's important because this whole thing is based off of the way you walk in the world, the way you hold yourself and carry yourself and the way that you, you look around and you extend that light and that love. So uh, just keep keep doing the next best thing and, and, and don't give up. That's what, that's what this is all about. But it is thinking about you. Uh -huh. And I think that's the important uh -huh. part is that you are stronger with community mm. mentally, 
physically, all, all of those angles. They've done tons of scienti- scientific studies <laughs> that humans thrive in communities. Yes. And it's isolation where we see a lot of these problems Ooh. coming up. So it's you actually are thinking about yourself yeah. when you're thinking about the community as a whole. I love that. And so it's just remembering that you are a part of the community. Thank you. Man, let's round it out. Um, that was my Earth Angel series. I've got the most amazing people in my life, and I, I wanted to share them with you. Um, this is the last episode that I'm doing in this studio, so just gonna be this like yeah, like this is yeah, this is it, Grace. This is it, and um, thank you, and thank you to everyone that's watching, listening, and following. Please like, subscribe, subscribe, share, do all the things so that I can keep this going because I know that the next level of this game is so exciting. Like I'm so excited for it, and I'd love for you to be a part of it in any way possible. So please reach out and in the meantime just go in love peace and love thank you for listening to Critical Root Zone if you'd like to reach out email us at criticalrootzone at gmail.com 